valuable jewel for creationists. Now, what is amber? Amber is not hardened tree sap. Tree sap is rather watery. It is more toward the center of a trunk of a tree, and it carries vital nutrients and minerals through the tree trunk. But amber is made from hardened wood resin, usually from a coniferous tree, such as a fir tree, a pine, or a spruce, or a, a cowrie tree, such as they have in New Zealand. But it's kind of the immune system of the tree if a branch is broken off by wind or if a falling tree hits another tree and puts a gash in its side, that makes the tree compromised to where like fungi and other infectious agents could get into it. So the resin flows out and it's very thick and sticky. If you've ever, you know, basically it's pitch, if you've had pitch like on a peach tree or something, that's resin. So it's designed to trap any insects or any other creatures that try to get in and exploit that weakness in the tree. It forms a kind of a chemical uh, protective scab and it has antiseptic qualities. So it will kill fungus and other agents that might try to infect the tree. And of course, insects can easily get trapped in it like flypaper and then further flowing of the resin will entomb the insects and even larger creatures can get caught in it, kind of like a tar baby. But eventually with reaction, especially with oxygen in the atmosphere, it oxidizes it tends to dry out, crumble, and uh, crystallize somewhat, and it falls to the ground and continues to just weather into the ground. It does not turn into an amber gem, unless unusual conditions allow that to happen. The kind of conditions that we have during the great Genesis flood. So some trees, like the cowrie tree in New Zealand, are especially rich in resin. If you were to take an ax and cut a big gouge in the side of this tree, huge, prolific, profuse amounts of resin would flow forth. And this may not look that big without perspective to compare it to, but uh, with the person there at the bottom, you can see that although the cowrie tree is not as tall as the redwoods, the circumference of the trunk does rival the size of the redwoods. And we believe it was something probably like a cowrie tree that produced the largest known uh, well, nugget, maybe boulder would be a good description, a big boulder of amber. And they found this uh, in the Baltic Sea area, actually in Denmark. It was found in a coastal marsh and apparently had been thrown up during a very bad storm or perhaps even a tsunami. They found it there back in the 1700s and they estimated its weight in excess of 2,600 pounds. And it was as large as a mid-sized automobile. Now, that should have been put into a museum so we could see it to this day, but there was much money to be made by cutting it into little amber jewels and selling it that way. And of course, money always talks. So it would have been awesome to see that. But these kind of trees, uh, coniferous trees that exude amber would be especially producing a lot during the Great Genesis Flood. Now here at Mount St. Helens, we have a kind of a microcosm of what we would expect to be happening during the flood. Volcanoes would be blasting down forests, tsunamis would be stripping forests off the continents. Eventually, high velocity flood currents ripping across the continents would literally rip up forests and vegetation, denuding the continents of all their plant life. But a lot of it would float. And so you would have much like we have at the situation here at Spirit Lake at Mount St. Helens, the blast force, they estimate at a minimum was 10 megaton blast force up to 20 megatons, 20 million tons of TNT and it blew down, they estimate, about a billion board feet of lumber. And shortly thereafter, we ended up with, they estimate, nearly a million logs on the surface of Spirit Lake there at the base of Mount St. Helens. And this is kind of what we'd expect during the Great Genesis Flood. You'd have these forests and vegetation ripped off the continents, floating on the floodwaters. These uh, tree trunks would be bashing and battering into one another with wind and wave action, so big gouges would be cut into the bark and into the tree. Eventually, all the bark we would expect to get broken off by all this uh, action of banging and bashing into one another. So that's how we would explain the very rich deposits in sediments around the world that we have found of resin that through heat and pressure has hardened, hardened enough that it can be used as a gem, such as I have on my ring here. So 
The best way that we believe to explain the origin of coal and the origin, <coughs> excuse me, the origin of amber is that these huge mats of vegetation stripped off the continents, floating on the floodwaters uh, as the vegetation got waterlogged and, and uh, filtered down to the bottom, further currents bringing in sediments would then cover it, compress it as it got compressed deeper and deeper. You would have heating from compression. Uh, there's also geochemical processes that could produce heat, as well as, of course, uh, geothermal processes related to volcanism, of which there would have been a lot during the great Genesis flood. So we find that often associated with coal, we find upright trees. We found this at Mount St. Helens too. They towed a sonar, thrish, sonar fish to get uh, sonar readings, and they found a whole upright forest of trees on the bottom of Spirit Lake, where they had floated and gone down upright and stuck in the debris at the bottom. And of course, these trees didn't grow there. You know, if the lake was drained later by you know, an earthquake or something, and you had all these upright trees, people might imagine, oh, those trees grew there, no. They were blasted down, they were transported, they sank in an upright position. Of course, during the Genesis flood, you'd have these currents constantly bringing in new and new layers of sediment, which would build up and encase them and fossilize them. Uh, for a tree to be growing in a peat bog, which is what they claim, <laughs> got the coal, uh, it would have to just stand there for millions of years while the sediment is gradually building up. And of course, the top of it would have rotted into oblivion long before that could happen for it to be through layer after layer of both sediment and coal. It would have had to have been rapid. And often in the coal, as a byproduct of coal, and in the surrounding sediments the coal is entrapped in, we find these amber specimens, this wood resin. Now, when it's on the ocean like that during the flood and banging into one another, all kinds of dead animals, insects, all kinds of dead things, would be floating on the water and the wind and wave action banging these things into each other would knock them into the amber on the sides of these logs. And we have experiments to prove that when it's in water, amber will remain soft and sticky for a much longer time than if it's just exposed to the open air. So it tends to harden out after a while, exposed to air, but it can stay soft, pliable, and sticky when it's in water. So you, we'd expect all kinds of things floating on the surface to get bashed into the amber, or in this case, it would still be soft, wood resin. This would produce bubbles that would get trapped, uh, enclaves of water, packets of water, smashed into and encapsulated in the soft resin. And of course, as the resin falls off to the bottom, it would encounter ocean bottom creatures like crabs, trilobites, barnacles, all kinds of things that we have found encased in amber, which we believe the best way to explain that is indeed the scenario we would have with the great Genesis flood. So for thousands of years, the only known place to get amber in uh, the Western Hemisphere was along the Baltic Sea, especially the southern coast <coughs> of the Baltic Sea. I'll give you a close up here. And that's that sea that's below Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Now apparently, when the continents rose at the end of the flood, the water draining off the continents produced a kind of a channel in here. And that eroded down and cut down to one of these layers that was rich in amber from a floating uh, log net. Uh, further, it was carved out, we believe, after the flood with the Ice Age. Predictably, there would be an Ice Age after the flood. In fact, the flood by far gives the best conditions to explain how an Ice Age could happen at all. I talk about that in my DVD out there, Worldwide Geological Evidence for the Genesis Flood. But anyway, we find that through both erosion and the carving of the glaciers, it carved down to this amber-rich sedimentary layer. So amber is relatively light. It's, uh, it's light enough that if it has enough bubbles in it, it will actually float. And that explains why we have in some cases found amber clear as far out as uh, Northern England and Scotland. Now, not a whole lot, but sometimes it floats its way clear out to there. But it's semi-buoyant, even if it doesn't have very many bubbles, so it's very lightweight, it's easily moved along by currents, and in a storm, it can be thrown up onto the Baltic coast. So for thousands of years, that was the best way to find amber, is go out beachcombing after a big storm, <clears throat> or especially after a tsunami, but you, know, you don't want something like that to happen. But after a big storm, you could find it. The ancients thought that they were tears of the sun that had fallen into the sea and hardened. And that was their explanation. 
By the first century, the Romans had figured out, we have written history indicating they realized it was hardened uh, tree resin. And uh, one of the indications of that is for centuries it has been burned as incense. If you have little fragments of it that are too small to be used for jewelry, they would simply burn it and it gives off this rich, uh, warm, sweet aroma of pine because it is the resin of a coniferous tree. Now then, for thousands of years, they have used simple technology like a uh, you know, fine mesh nets, and even if it's not a storm, usually after a storm is a good time to find it on the beach, but you can actually wade out into the surf with these nets and fish around like this, and the waves will throw it up into the water it might not be able to throw it up on, onto the beach unless there's a storm, but it'll throw it up in the water and you kind of comb through the water with your net and come up with pieces of amber. So that has been done for thousands of years and it is still called Baltic gold in the Baltic region. Now, for thousands of years, because it was so rare, it was worth a lot of money. Nowadays, we have found amber all over the world. As we'd expect, just like coal, where the conditions were correct during the flood, it would form all over the world. And because of supply and demand, it's not as precious as it used to be. Today, it's just a semi-precious gem. But for centuries, it was very precious. The only place to get it was at the Baltic coast. And so during the Middle Ages, the lords had a law passed that any uh, serf or non-nobleman who dared trespass on a privately owned amber beach, it was a death penalty, and not, not even a trial or anything, just on the testimony of witnesses, They'd build a watchtower, as we see there in the upper left-hand corner, so they could look up and down the beach. And if they caught a trespasser, even if you didn't have amber in your sack or in your pockets, you would get hung out there publicly and left to rot into a skeleton. Pretty brutal times back then. But that was because they took this very seriously. It was worth a lot of money back then, and they did not tolerate any thievery. Now then... Emperor Nero, first century Roman emperor who was a terrible emperor by all historical accounts and was especially horrible to the Christians. He terribly persecuted the early Christians in his time. And he fancied himself an artist. He loved artwork. He loved jewelry. And of course, amber was one of the uh, most precious jewels back at that time. And he is purported to have said that a single good quality amber carving, no bigger than a thumb, was worth the price of two healthy slaves, quite a bit of money. At its height of rarity and preciousness, which was a bit over 2,000 years ago, it was said that it had a 200 to 1 weight ratio of value compared to gold. In other words, one pound of well-polished, uh, well-carved amber jewels would be worth 200 pounds in gold. So it was extremely precious back at that time. One of the reasons that Julius Caesar fought the Gallic Wars to get up into northern Gaul, which comprised not only France, but Belgium and uh, the Netherlands and parts of western Germany, was to get access to the Baltic coast because they wanted to get horn in on that very lucrative, valuable amber trade back then because it was so extremely precious. Now then, <clears throat> again, because we have found it all over the world now, it's not as precious as just a semi-precious gem, but it is still very beautiful. Now, after the movie, movie Jurassic Park came out, there was a kind of a spike in uh, the popularity and in the price of amber, because as you may remember, the thesis of the movie was an amber miner had found this big chunk of amber and a beautifully fossilized uh, mosquito in there with a big fat abdomen full of blood. And he supposedly had had a blood meal on a dinosaur. And so they were finding these uh, you know, mosquitoes and amber with blood in them and drilling in and extracting the blood to get the DNA. And supposedly, you know, to clone something, you have to put it in a viable egg of the same species. Of course, we don't have any viable dinosaur eggs, but they in the movie said we'd put them in amphibian eggs, which are not only not the same species, they're not even the same class as reptiles. So it was pure science fiction, but you know, it makes a good movie. But it did cause a spike in interest and the value of amber. Now, because it was so beautiful and so valued, the father of Frederick William I, back when uh, the German area was called Prussia, he had an amber room built for his wife, the queen, and he didn't complete it, and his son, Frederick William I of Prussia, who inherited the throne after his father passed away, he didn't really care about it. He didn't want to go through the expense to uh, complete the room, 
And so he sought to curry favor with Peter the Great of Russia because he wanted to form an alliance with him against Sweden. Sweden was a major European power at that time. And uh, Peter the Great was not only great because of his achievements, he was also great in stature. Does anybody know how tall Peter the Great was? Yeah. He was six foot six, which especially in his day was quite tall indeed, as tall today, taller than me for sure. Anyway, uh, so he gave that partial amber room that hadn't been finished to Peter the Great, and Peter the Great and Catherine the Great liked it, but they never did uh, get it put together. They wanted to make a bigger room with more amber, buy more amber, and make a really spectacular room. That actually wasn't done until after Peter the Great died, and his daughter, which I believe, uh, I remember her name now, but anyway, she fancied that she wanted to finish that project, and she hired an Italian craftsman who was an expert in crafting amber, and he designed with an Italian flair the amber room. And it eventually became what the Russians called the eighth wonder of the world. It had the estimate on the walls, which were 30 feet tall. It had an estimated 13,000 pounds of Baltic amber, elaborately carved and polished, and was indeed one of the most beautiful indoor sites you could ever see. It uh, was designed so that large windows on the west end would allow the sun as it was coming down low on the, rise, on the horizon at sunset to shine directly into the room and onto the amber. By all accounts, it was just an ethereal glow of uh, incredible beauty. It was just phenomenal. And so it was considered by the Russians the eighth wonder of the world, and it stood unmolested from the 1700s clear up until World War II. And it was put into the Catherine Palace, which is outside of St. Petersburg. If you ever get to Russia up near St. Petersburg, it's worth going and taking a look. And this palace was quite large, not just the entrance there, but the whole palace is huge. With an aerial view, you get an idea of how big the palace and the courtyards are. So there it stood until World War II with the invasion of the Nazis. Uh, they were told to take any artwork out of Europe that had any value at all. And of course, they really wanted to get their hands on the Amber Room because it had so much amber, it was worth many millions of dollars even back then. So the Russians, with their, uh, with their expectancy of the Germans coming, weren't sure what to do. The Germans were advancing by their blitzkrieg tactic faster than the Russians expected. They realized, you know, they're practically at the gates. What are we going to do? And so they tried to cover up the amber walls with wallpaper because they didn't have time to take it down and hide it. Uh, the Russians didn't do a good enough job. <laughs> And uh, the Nazis saw through the ruse, and so they sent in a small army of soldiers, and in literally about one and a half days, they completely stripped the walls of all the amber. They put it into about 30 large crates and hauled it off back southeast to Königsberg, uh, which had been conquered by Germany with their advance. It was actually an enclave of Russia there. Uh, but they took it to the Königsberg castle, and there they put at least part of it on display as a kind of a war trophy. But the fortunes of war had changed. By 1944, the Germans were in retreat and they had to give up this conquered territory. The Soviet armies were just about to invade uh, this city, which today is called Kaliningrad. And preceding their invasion, they had an aerial bombardment and an artillery barrage that badly damaged the Königsberg Castle and set it on fire. And of course, as we know, amber is flammable. That's why they burned it as incense for so many centuries. And most historians think that it simply was burned up because we've found no trace of it anywhere. Uh, there are stories, of course, that they put it in crates and buried it somewhere. But if so, no living person knows where in the world that is. And there was a story that it was on a ship that sank in the Baltic Sea, but they found that ship. They've dived on it, investigated it, can't find it. So if there were a category in the Guinness Book of World Records, for the largest, the heaviest, and the most expensive work of art ever stolen and never recovered. This would be it. Modern estimates of its value range from, uh, at a low end, 200 million to at a high end in excess of $600 million. It has never been recovered. Well, this stuck in the craw of the Russians. This had been their eighth wonder of the world, and they suffered enough at the hands of the Nazis than to have this great artistic treasure robbed and lost uh, really bothered them. So in 1979, under the administration of Brezhnev, Leonid Brezhnev, 
the Russian government authorized a replica Amber Room to be created. It wasn't going to be quite as big. The walls were only going to be about 20 feet tall instead of 30. And they weren't going to use quite as much amber, but they were going to try to at least recreate some of the beautiful filigreed artwork that had been originally done. Now, he never lived to see it completed. He died a few years after that. It actually took 24 years to complete it. And they hired craftsmen uh, who had at least some knowledge of how to work with amber, used old photographs that were black and white to you know, try to get the style that, you know, Italianistic style that was used. And they worked on it so long because they didn't have a little, whole lot of money. They just had relatively few craftsmen working on it and it took 24 years. And they couldn't even have made it without some help of all things ironically from Germany. I guess the Germans had pangs of conscience about the fact <laughs> that their ancestors had stolen it and lost it. So they gave money and Baltic amber to help it be completed. And 24 years later, in 2003, it was dedicated by Putin. But we, we see when we look here that the amber is not as thick as it was in the original. They had to cut corners somehow, so the wall wasn't as high, the amber wasn't as thick. And when Putin dedicated it in 2003, uh, it looked beautiful, but just, it just wasn't as big. But it certainly was rather spectacular nonetheless. And nowadays you can go there, it's just outside of St. Petersburg, and go and take a tour of it. Sometimes they have press conferences there, as uh, beautiful paintings on the ceiling. And although it's not as big and as opulent and as grand as the original, I think it has still captured much of the amazing beauty that the original had, and would well be worth taking a look at if you ever get into that part of Russia. So, Amber has been, for thousands of years, a valuable and beautiful gem, but it is especially valuable for creationists. Why? Because it acts as a chronometer or a time clock that indicates that those layers of strata that they date sometimes to be well over a hundred million years old can actually only be several thousand years old because these fossils literally act like a short time clock, almost like a little egg timer. You know, you turn it over. If you come into a room and you see an egg timer running, you know, it's going to be got, done in a minute. So, you know, somebody turned that over pretty recently because it doesn't last that long. And it is the same with the amber fossils. Uh, just several thousands of years at the most could explain what they look like. And I have actual amber fossils out there that you look at with your own eyes through the microscope and see exactly what I am talking about. Now, the reason it's so valuable is because it turns out to be even a stronger argument than the soft tissue, the uh, protein structure, and the elaborate cell structure that we still see intact within dinosaur bones. Dinosaur bones are supposed to be anywhere from 65 million to up to 230 million years old. Yet these things we know based on sound physics and experiments cannot last much past uh, several hundred thousand years at the most. Now, Dr. Mary Schweitzer is a paleontologist at North Carolina State University, and she is an evangelical Christian, goes to an evangelical church, but she has this idea, well, when I'm in the science lab, I put on my science hat, and I agree with all whatever the scientists say. When I go to church, I put on my church hat, and I believe the word of God. It's kind of a schizophrenic way of looking at things. <laughs> you know, kind of double-minded, like the Bible says, <laughs> don't be double-minded. But she is an evangelical Christian, I'm grateful for that. But when she found this, this was found at first in a T-Rex femur, the femur bone they found in the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, when they wrapped it up like they do to, to help preserve it, it was so heavy that the helicopter they had rented to airlift it out of there couldn't lift it. And they had a time limit as to how long it, they could have to get it out of there. And so under pressure, they said, well, we don't like to do this, but we're gonna have to break it. And they broke it into and took out one piece and then another. So Jack Horner, a very famous uh, dinosaur scientist that uh, Mary Schweitzer at that time was working under as a doctoral candidate for a PhD in paleontology, uh, he said, you know, we don't often uh, break open big dinosaur bones. Why don't you take a look at it under the microscope and see what you can see? What you found was shocking to everybody. Uh, intact, soft tissue, stretchy blood vessels, you squeeze out the contents, nucleated red blood cells, such as you find in reptiles. And she did 17 different tests trying to prove it was something else, but it all came back positive. It really is what it looks like. So she because she believed the earth was millions of years old and that God used evolution as his means of creation, 
Instead of saying, gee, this proves the Bible is right after all. God had this little secret that we never even saw until the beginning of the 21st century, showing his word is true and these fossils were buried in the great Genesis flood no more than uh, four and a half, five thousand years ago at the most. Therefore, they can't show a progression of evolution over many, many millions of years, but rather a world that was judged and buried recently, relatively recently. And she could have told all her atheist colleagues that always bothered her for being an evangelical Christian, you know. Uh, she could have said, hey, you know, God gets the last laugh here. Look what I found. But she didn't. She reacted against it. She didn't want to admit she was wrong about the age. So she did experiments, and she came up with the idea that iron somehow would preserve this for millions of years. Now, there's no histologist I know of anywhere who would agree with that. Histologists study biological tissue. But she seemed to think so. And she ran some experiments that lasted a few years and said, well, I think it'll last for millions of years. Well, we have experiments that can be done. They're called thermodynamic experiments, where you take these proteins and you heat them up to a certain temperature. Thermodynamic breakdown is much more efficient at high temperature than low temperature. So you run it at a high temperature uh, for weeks, perhaps even months, observe the rate of breakdown, usually, usually using a spectroscopy device that can very accurately show the breakdown. Then you say, okay, at this temperature, it's breaking down at this rate. Then you take it at a lower temperature. At a lower temperature, it's breaking down slower. At another lower temperature, it's breaking down slower. So you get this curve. Then you can apply the Arrhenius equations that are designed to predict even at extremely low temperature, like sub-freezing Arctic permafrost, how long would it take? Well, it turns out even then, it would only take a few million years for it all to break down. But at normal temperatures above freezing, Relatively cool, like we have uh, you know, average temperature when you get 10 feet down into the earth, stays average for quite a long time, and it's about 55 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 10 degrees uh, Celsius. At that temperature, this would all break down within just a few hundreds of thousands of years. And that's what the actual experiments show. You know, We see the rate of breakdown, we project how long it would take. It doesn't take that long. So, we have this fellow here, Dr. Hugh Ross. He's the founder and president of Reasons, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Reasons to Believe Ministries. And uh, my ministry is called Reasons for Faith. So I, I made it that way, so maybe people trying to look up his ministry would get me instead on the internet. <laughs> but at any rate, he is an evangelical Christian, believes in the deity of Christ, virgin birth, resurrection, all the orthodox Christian doctrines. But he believes God used billions of years to create everything. And this bothered him. He didn't want the Bible to be literally true, which again, with Mary Schweitzer and him, they're evangelical Christians, why wouldn't they embrace this and say God gets the last laugh? All these evolutionists who won't listen, here we've destroyed their theory. Their fossil record can't be anywhere near as old as they claim, and that destroys evolution at the very foundation. But instead, he said, no, we gotta figure out how it can last long. So he said, if a sample is isolated from any exposure to bacteria and oxygen, then the soft tissue evidence easily can be preserved for over 100 million years. <coughs> so he mentions two things. There are five things that will break down proteins in much less than one million years. Five, not two. He only mentions two. Bacteria, which of course will get in and eat it up, metabolize it, and oxygen, which by the process of oxidation will uh, corrode it. O oxygen is a very corrosive agent. It's what causes rust in steel and things like that. And it definitely affects biochemicals as well. So he said, well, to get rid of those two things, it can last virtually forever, supposedly. One of his colleagues on staff at his ministry was Dr. Fazel Rana. Now he got saved out of Islam, which my hat's off to him for that, because that's not easy. He is an evangelical Christian. But again, he believes God used billions of years. So when he found this evidence, and Mary Schweitzer found it, he said, well, I've got a PhD in biochemistry. I'm going to try to refute this. And so he authored a book called Dinosaur Blood in the Age of the Earth. And in that book, <coughs> he said this. He said collagen, which happens to be one of the toughest proteins, one of the most resistant to thermodynamic decay over time, especially bone collagen, the, the toughest form of collagen. He said collagen, or at least fragments of it, could survive 68 million years in an environment devoid of water oxygen, and microbes. So having a PhD in biochemistry, he listed three instead of Hugh Ross's two. Now remember, there's five. Didn't even mention them. Anybody know what those other two are? If you don't, it's not by accident that you don't. They don't like to talk about it. 
They only talk about it if you know about it and bring it up. And then they're uneasy about it because they know they don't really have any good answer based on experiments to back up what they believe. They just believe, well, it can last long. We didn't realize it could last this long, but we all agree that it can last a long time. Well, I'm glad that you're in agreement, but science isn't determined by what the majority believes. It's determined by experimental data and facts, and it does not support your majority agreement. Sad but true, it supports the Bible. They sure don't like that, it seems, but that's the reality of it. So here I quote Buckley and Collins, a couple of evolutionist scientists who have done extensive Thermodynamic studies of bone collagen found in both human bones and animal bones found at archaeological sites. Now, these archaeological sites, everybody would agree, is at the most, you know, a few thousands of years old, not millions of years old. So finding cells intact, osteocyte cells in bones, finding proteins intact, this was not a big deal. It's only several thousands of years old. They ran these thermodynamic experiments, and this was their conclusion. It will take between 0.2 and 0.7 million years, or in other words, 200,000 to at the most 700,000 years at a cool temperature, 10 degrees Celsius, just 50 degrees Fahrenheit, for levels of collagen to fall to just 1%. In other words, 99% of it's gone, fallen into dust in that short time scale. And notice what he says, in an optimum burial environment, what does that mean? That means you've already automatically excluded microbes, oxygen, and uh, water, which breaks things down by hydrolysis, the hydrolytic effect of water. Water is called the universal what? Universal solvent, because it breaks down a wider variety of chemicals than any other known solvent. And it certainly does, over time, break down biochemicals like proteins and DNA. So here they published all this data. Notice this was a number of years ago. And this was, uh, you know, they've done all this data, and then they found dinosaur bones that had it. You know, this is not archaeological sites. These are bones supposed to be a minimum of 65 million years old and older. Now it's a problem. All this data is saying this can't be there if it's that old. It could only be there if it's relatively young. So they really didn't like this. They said, we've got to just argue that this stuff isn't real. It's just a weird anomaly that looks like it's real, but it's not. That's literally the position these guys took. But it's now been published more than 122 times internationally. It's an accepted fact that the soft tissue, intact cell structure, and protein structure is found in all kinds of fossils, not just dinosaur fossils, but even ones that are supposed to be hundreds of millions of years older than the dinosaurs, down in the so-called Cambrian age. So it is a major problem indeed, <coughs> but it gets worse. Dr. Brian Thomas on the left, he has a PhD in paleobiochemistry. He got his PhD at the University of Liverpool in England. He is a biologist and then did his doctoral work in this new field of examining intact biochemistry in fossil bones. It was right down his alley. He used more sophisticated, up-to-date spectroscopy devices that we have today that Buckley and Collins did not have ac access to, the F-tier spectroscopy device. It's able to much more accurately and efficiently measure rates of breakdown. What he found, at, at, as he put on this chart here at a science symposium, was that these proteins are breaking down twice as fast, at least twice as fast or more than what was able to be detected by Buckley and Collins. In other words, you can take that 700,000 year maximum, take it down to 350,000 year maximum for the toughest protein, collagen. The others are not as tough. You can divide that by three for them, a little over 100,000 years. They shouldn't be around anymore. So it uh, is a bit of a problem. Dr. Kevin Anderson, PhD in biology and author of the book Echoes of the Jurassic, which is available from the uh, Creation Research Society, of which I'm a, a lifetime sustaining member. And just look that up, Creation Research Society on the internet if you want to order one. But in that book, he studied this quite a bit and conferred with Dr. Basil Rana and others. He said, plus many documented examples of preserved tissue and proteins come from fossils in virtually bloodless settings. In other words, there's no blood there with the iron in it from hemoglobin to give it this magical ability to last for millions of years, the way Mary Schweitzer thought it should. Uh, he says, the preservation of dinosaur and reptile skin, preservation of a chitin protein complex in a beard worm, this was down in the Cambrian, over 500 million years old, and a sponge and preservation of protein derivatives 
in a consortium of algae were certainly not a result of blood baths that soaked the biomaterial in hemoglobin. So he's saying even if she were right, and others who have tried to do it, her experiment found it didn't work for them. That's a big red flag in science. If you have an experiment that's true, everybody doing the same experiment should get the same result, but we haven't. But it totally undercuts her old argument. We have found it now where there is no iron from blood or from the environment. And it has to explain everything across the board. And since it can't, it's not a viable explanation. He also said many of these dinosaur proteins, for example, hemoglobin, myosin, actin, and tropomyosin, are not nearly as structurally resistant to degradation as collagen. In fact, there is no experimental evidence that all these other proteins could survive for more than a fraction of the time that collagen could survive. They don't like to talk about the other proteins, but the experiments show even the tough protein collagen will break down in just hundreds of thousands of years, and even less for regular proteins. So he goes on to say that in the book Dinosaur Blood in the Age of the Earth by Dr. Fazal Rana, he mentions the ravaging effects of ground radiation. So remember those five things that break it down? Microbes, oxygen, water, the second law of thermodynamics, the law of increasing disorder over time, a proven physical law that we can test with experiments and see how long it takes, and it only takes hundreds of thousands of years. But the fifth one is ground radiation. You see, these sediments <coughs> that things were buried, that the fossils were buried in during the flood, were eroding primarily igneous rocks that have inclusions of uranium and thorium, which are radioactive. So you have all these little particles in these sediments that surround these fossils that are emitting mild amounts of radiation, alpha, beta, and even gamma radiation. Now it's low level background radiation, but it should be more than sufficient within again several hundred thousand years to wipe out all biological proteins, just for that reason alone. They don't even like to talk about that. Notice he didn't mention it. He later mentions it in a fine print footnote. <laughs> you know, so they say, well, I mentioned it, yeah, but not in the main text. So he said, uh, he even cites my challenge that no preservation model can counter the effects of radiation exposure over the course of millions of years. Yet he fails to offer any answer to this problem. Why? Don't you think if they had an answer, they'd say, well, here's the obvious answer and here's experiments to prove this answer is correct. No, they haven't got a clue. It's not something they want to talk about and you don't know about it because they haven't been talking about it. How many of you knew ground radiation was a problem for fossils? Well, not by accident. They don't like to talk about it. And they don't like to talk about the fact that thermodynamic decay by the experiments, not by their biased opinion, but by actual experiments shows it can't last more than hundreds of thousands of years. So he continues, other studies also challenge the iron model. Paleontologist Derek Briggs cites results of a study where the addition of iron did not slow the decay of shrimp. Analysis of the Thessalosaurus vertebrae, this was a vertebrae of the Thessalosaurus dinosaur found in the Hell Creek Formation up in Montana, it found that iron was present in some of the surrounding fossil, but virtually no iron was detected within the preserved tissue. Neither does this model, nor any preservation model, protect the tissue and proteins from the ravages of ground radiation. So of the five things that can break these down, things down in far less than one million years, two of them apply definitely to dinosaur soft tissues, but four out of the five apply to amber fossils. That's what we're gonna see. That's why it's even more powerful evidence. Four out of those five definitely apply with amber fossils. Now, as I said, it's not just insects and arachnids and things like that that you find in amber. You can find birds. We found frogs. We found crabs. We found, uh, you know, trilobites. Uh, we found lizards, all kinds of things that get stuck in amber. Here we have the head and beak of a bird. Here we have all kinds of lizard fossils that have been found. Of course, these were floating on the surface of the floodwaters, getting bashed into the amber on these logs. They would get entombed for sure. Uh, this one looked like it got bashed pretty good, but it still got preserved. And sometimes we find just incredible preservation. I mean, look at the eyes. This should have fallen in the dust by thermodynamic decay within just several hundreds of thousands of years. It's cut in half, as you'd expect, from all that violent action on the surface of the water. Its front uh, foot is severed, but the rest of it is in remarkably good condition. And here we have a, an entire one. This is extremely rare. This would fetch easily several tens of thousands of dollars at auction. 
Now here on the lower right, we have the shell of an ammonite, an extinct cephalopod, a marine creature that belongs in the same class as squid and octopi and uh, cuttlefish and uh, chambered nautilus, but it's extinct. We don't have anything quite like it today, but in this one large piece of amber here, we have actually evidence of 40 different species, insects, ammonite, mites, spiders, millipedes, beetles, cockroaches, flies, wasps, sea slaters, and marine gastropods, which means marine snails. So that's what your ammonite would look like with an artist's conception if it were still alive today. And what about the many other marine organisms found in amber? Barnacles. You know, they don't <laughs> usually end up right by a tree, but if the tree is exuding amber that's falling down to the bottom of the ocean, yeah, it could run into, into uh, barnacles, also a marine isopod, crab, nice little crab, and marine snail, trilobite. Trilobite is a bottom-dwelling crab-like creature somewhat similar to horseshoe crab, which are still around today. They're supposed to have been exactly the same for hundreds of millions of years, didn't change, still here. But apparently the trilobites couldn't uh, survive the changes in the, the world environment as a result of a flood, and they went extinct. But amber would be falling down on the ocean bottom and easily could entomb a trilobite like that. Also red algae, which is of a marine variety, ocean variety. And diatoms. These are these microscopic, beautiful little jewels of the sea that are made by single-celled plants, single-celled algae, that extract dissolved silica, the basic uh, mineral we find in glass, and make their own glass houses that have refractive properties that give them even beautiful, vibrant colors in many cases. I have a couple of examples of diatoms out there as well. These, of course, would get entombed in amber if it, the logs were floating on the surface of the water during the flood. Now, what's significant about plants? We find plant material in amber. On an average, about one in 16 pieces of amber has some type of a plant fossil in it. As when it comes to an animal, even an insect, it's one in 500. So, lots of plants. Why is that a problem? Plants don't have any collagen at all. No collagen. So, collagen wouldn't last anyway, but these have the less uh, resistant proteins and should have fallen into dust within tens of thousands of years to 100,000 years or so at the most. And we find all kinds of plants, including ones that are still green. I mean, look at the green color there. Look at all the bubbles. Those bubbles have oxygen in them, which causes oxidation. It should have burned holes into this uh, green tree leaf. The green is there from certain pigmentation uh, biomolecules that selectively absorb certain wavelengths of light and powerfully reflect one wavelength, in this case, green. So it's still there. Those proteins haven't degraded. They haven't fallen apart. They're still able to look green after supposedly 99 million years. Here we have, when it says a flower bloom, but it's actually a flower bud. But notice half of it is encapsulated with a bubble. And we have all kinds of bubbles in amber, and often the bubbles encapsulate you know, fossils that are there. So when, when the amber is still soft, if it's impacted, it will squeeze. And it often the bubble that's originally round will be squeezed and misshapen and actually can form onto these fossils. Now, does anybody know a very, very rapid example of oxidation that we've all seen at one time or another? Very rapid oxidation. What do we call it? Fire. Absolutely fire. At very high temperature, oxidation is extremely efficient. At low temperature, it's still burning, it's still oxidizing, it's still corroding. It's burning this thing into ashes and dust. It's just doing it at cool temperature in extremely slow motion, and it will take at least several tens of thousands of years. But by that time, half of this thing should have been burnt into ashes and dust by oxidation alone. This thing's supposed to be 42 million years old. Now, these insects preserved in amber are still glowing with color and reflectivity 99 million years later. I don't think so. Now, in this case, it's not those, pro, uh, those uh, pigment polymers that selectively reflect the light. It's actual microstructures, very, very tiny. You can't even see them without a microscope, that are actually on the uh, outside of these insects, and they selectively reflect in the correct wavelength. And they do it repeatedly and powerfully, so you get this deep, rich, metallic, shiny light color. 
So the shiny and colorful skin on some bugs does not come from pigment molecules, but ridges, microscopic ridges, which direct light to create the effect. Okay, so those should have disappeared by thermodynamic decay in just tens of thousands of years. They'd be so corrupted that they wouldn't work anymore. But look at all these, found in 99 million year old amber, they claim. The amber is just a bio molecule. It would have corrupted and, and fallen into dust. The fossils would have fallen into dust. But these microstructures are so small and delicate, they would have fallen into dust first. Yet they're still there, beautifully reflecting this color after supposedly 100 million years. I don't think so. They're glowing because they're glowing with youth. That's the obvious implication. Now, here we have supposedly the world's oldest mosquito found in amber they claim to be 130 million years old. Wow. See all the delicate structures? Nothing has, you know, corrupted into dust, uh, disintegrated, when it should be obvious signs of that, especially, you know, with those antennae, with those tiny little fibers. Oh, my goodness. A close-up of it there. Very little mass in those fibers. That would have disintegrated first. After just several tens of thousands of years, those should not exist. Yet there they are. Look at the eyes with the multiple lenses called omatidia. Those should have corrupted. But they're there. I mean, it looks like somebody poured lucite, liquid lucite, on this yesterday, and it hardened overnight, and here it is. Well, on the time scale they're talking about, a few thousand years would be like yesterday. <laughs> it would still look this good, but not much longer. Okay, we have a fossil uh, termite I have from my own private collection. And amber jewelry, the conversation pace for creation evidence. That's why I wear amber jewelry now with fossil insects in it. Because people say, oh, what is that? Is that an amber? Yes, that's genuine amber. This is supposed to be 99 million years old. But neither the amber nor the fossil in it could last that long. It would have fallen into dust based on proven experiments. Which goes to show you can't believe what they tell you. Scientists can be almost as bad as the politicians when it comes to telling the truth. <clears throat> now, I'm not so jaded as to say all politicians lie all the time. Some of them are actually good, thank God. Uh, a lot of them aren't, and they don't lie all the time. It's mainly just when their lips are moving that you have to look out. Okay, so be on the lookout. So often we have bubbles of air and bubbles of water, and these often intersect both uh, flora and fauna, in other words, plants and animal fossils. Here at the bottom we have what are called sepals, and these cover during the bud stage, and then they come out and have support at the bottom during the bloom stage. But we have a sepal here, in supposedly 99 million year old amber. Notice it looks like there's a bubble within a bubble. There's an air bubble within a packet of water inside the sepal. And therefore, if we turn it upside down, the bubble should move the opposite direction. So let's do that. When we turn it upside down, notice the inward bubble, which was near the surface, now has moved up. Yeah, it has water and oxygen, both hydrolysis to break it down, the universal solvent and oxidation, which is even more effective at breaking it down quicker. Of course, all kinds of both uh, animals and plants are intersected with bubbles. And this one here, take a close up, you see there's bubbles on its back, on its side, and on its underside. It's encapsulated with bubbles that should have burned its way through, destroyed its thorax within several tens of thousands of years at the most. Here we have a mosquito. Notice it has a bubble on its side and a bubble up on its shoulder. Take a close-up of that. Look at his shoulder there. You see the little hairs sticking out? Those little hairs should have been oxidized into oblivion within just several tens of thousands of years. This is supposed to be 42 million years old. And here we have a creature. You can see on the right side there a number of bubbles, but this one got caught in a big bubble. What is it? Anybody know? It's an aphid. Tiny little aphid encapsulated in a bubble yet it hasn't oxidized into dust, even though it's supposed to be 42 million years old. Here we have a spider with many bubbles directly, partially encapsulating it. Get a reverse angle view on here. Lots of oxygen there. In fact, they've shown that the bubbles in amber at the time that amber was formed, which we believe was during the Great Genesis Flood, that there was much more oxygen in the atmosphere at that time. Today is 21%. Back then it was averaging 29 to 30%. So it's not only oxygen there, there's a higher percentage than what we have today, making oxidation even more effective. What's really interesting, though, is that we found a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere back then. 
the evolutionists admit, admit at least four to five times as much as we have today. So everybody agrees, plant life was flourishing, animal life was flourishing at that time. It didn't seem to cause a global catastrophe. In fact, God must have thought carbon dioxide was good to have in the environment because plants love it. That's what they use in photosynthesis. We, we artificially pump CO2 into greenhouses for that very reason. It makes things grow better. Does anybody know what the current percentage of carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere today? You know, they all talk about we've got to lower the carbon dioxide level. We've got to, what is the actual level? These politicians, you ask them, what is it? Well, I don't know. I just know we've got to lower it. Well, that seems like a pretty ignorant answer. Anybody know what it is, by the way? It's 0.03%. Three one hundredths of one percent, and they're worried that there's too much. There used to be four to five times as much, and the world was more productive. So, a little lesson in geology there. That's why you don't you usually hear geologists getting on the environmental bandwagon to get rid of carbon dioxide. They know better. Now here we have a uh, spider, and we have all kinds of bubbles on the spider. Let's take a close up. Look, its legs have bubbles on it. Yeah, you can see the legs. The legs have not disintegrated into dust by oxidation. If you look closely, you'll see that the head and thorax is encased in a bubble, and so is the whole abdomen. This thing has bubbles upon bubbles all over it. Let's take a close-up of its abdomen. You can still see the hairs sticking out of the abdomen. That should have been disintegrated into dust in a few tens of thousands of years by oxidation alone. Another spider, again, big bubbles on its rear leg. The hairs you can see in there haven't oxidized and destroyed into dust. Big bubble on the front leg there, and you can see the leg and the hairs on the leg, the thin hairs that should have oxidized very quickly. They're still visible. This thing is supposed to be 42 million years old. And here we have a fly with a bubble on it, but to its left, what is that? It looks kind of like a spider, but it's not. It looks like a mite, and it is. Mites are smaller than ticks, but they look a lot like ticks, except mites often have a lot of hair on them, whereas ticks don't. This is one I have out here you can look at yourself. Notice in the close-up, it's completely encapsulated in a bubble. And yet we can see on the rear of its abdomen, hairs sticking out. I mean, this thing is so tiny, it's a tiny little mite. And the hairs have gotta be super tiny. And they easily would have been oxidized, but there they are, and it's supposed to be 42 million years old. I don't think so. And it insults my intelligence to tell me that it is. Now here we have, capsules of water with air bubbles in the water bubbles, okay? Packets of water with air bubbles in them. And when we move them, just like when you move the bubble in a carpenter's level, the bubble moves back and forth. You can see here, as you turn that amber fossil, the bubble moves because it's a bubble in water. So often these bubbles have been squished by the amber being pushed when it was still soft or they, when it was still soft resin. But the bubble is at the top. If we orient it to the side, the bubble should move to the side. And as we see, it did. So this is very common. Remember they said, oh, if we just get rid of water and oxygen, there's no problem. Well, guess what? We have both water and oxygen as a major problem in many of these amber fossils. Here we have moving water bubbles in an ant from Dominican amber, at least 25 to 40 million years old. And I, I made an error in not putting in all of the pictures in the sequence, I'll have to add them in, but it shows as you tilt it back and forth, that bubble in its abdomen moves left and right, just like a carpenter's level. <laughs> it's actually water inside the abdomen with a bubble. So the two things they claim, if you excluded that, oh, it'll last forever, well here it's right there in direct contact. And here's another one, a different ant specimen with the same problem for them. Notice you see the air bubble there on the left side of its abdomen. Now, if we tilt the head up a little bit, that bubble should move to the right. So let's see if it does. There it is. It moved to the right, didn't it? So it's water inside the abdomen with air. Both hydrolysis and oxidation should have obliterated that abdomen within just several tens of thousands of years, but it's still intact. That is simply not scientifically possible, unless it's young, then it would be. Now, 40 million year old DNA, if we're gonna say Kano, an evolutionist microbiologist at California State Polytechnic University, he dissected a Dominican stingless bee trapped in 25 to 40 million year old amber, they claim, found bacterial spores, which is a dormant state of bacteria. 
This is when the bacteria sense stress in the environment. They kind of enclose themselves in a kind of a, a shell, forming a spore, and they really reduce their metabolism to almost zero. It's almost like suspended animation or deep hibernation. And they can survive in that state until the environment gets better. But we're talking here millions of years, okay? So notice he was able to take this dormant state and revive them and grow them, analyze some of their DNA, and found it closely matches the same bacteria found in modern Dominican bees. Well, if it was millions of years difference between the DNA, it shouldn't be that close. But if it was only several thousand years, since the time of the flood, it would make perfect sense. But how in the world do you get spores to revive when they should have fallen into dust by thermodynamics alone in a few hundreds of thousands of years? Not millions of years like they claim. And here we have 45 million year old brewer's yeast that still works. So Stumptown Brewery in Guerneville, California brews its beer according to a unique formula. They got this yeast out of amber that the evolutionists told them was 45 million years old. It was in a dormant state, but they were able to revive it and get it to grow. And once it grows, these things multiply very rapidly so you can have a big supply of them. They used this yeast to make their beer. So their beer advertising campaign is come and taste what beer would have tasted like 45 million years ago. And what everybody says is it tastes like beer today. Yeah, because it isn't 45 million years old for one thing. Furthermore, how in the world could it be viable when the whole thing should have fallen into dust? within just hundreds of thousands of years at the most. How could it still be living? It's conceivable in a scale of just a few thousand years. You know, we find wheat in the Egyptian pharaoh's tombs that they spread out, a lot of it germinates after being there for thousands of years. God makes amazing things, but they can't defeat the second law of thermodynamics. They can't defeat ground radiation. They can't defeat oxidation by oxygen and hydrolysis by water. And we see that all the time in these amber fossils. So in Scientific American Magazine back in 1993, this was before they found the dinosaurs had all this proteins and everything in it and fragments of DNA, which we'd expect on that time scale. They said certain physical limits seem inescapable. In approximately 50,000 years, water alone strips bases from the DNA. Oxygen also contributes to the destruction of DNA, even in ideal conditions. In the absence of water and oxygen, and at low temperature, background radiation, that big old bug bugaboo that nobody wants to talk about, but none of you knew about, it must finally erase all genetic information and all proteins. The DNA is, is more delicate, so it would break down, you know, like with water 50,000 years, three to five times longer for proteins, but still we're just talking hundreds of thousands of years, and it's gone. How can it still be there? Well, the analogy that I like to use is if you come into a room and you see a still hot steaming cup of coffee and a cigarette that's still lit, still burning, and somebody says, we are here to certify that nobody has been in this building for more than one year. You'd say, wait a minute, this defies common sense. These are like little time clocks, like a little egg timer. You know, you turn it over, it doesn't last very long. If it's still running, you know it was turned over not a long time ago, less than a minute. Coffee doesn't remain hot and steaming for over a year, and neither does a cigarette burn that long. I mean, this is common sense, you know. It, it's self-evident truth, you know. Ah, yeah, but you see, we were hired as the experts in security. This big company wants to pay us a big salary and a big bonus if we would pass this test, and that is that we don't allow anybody to trespass in this building for more than a year. And uh, one of the honest men on the team says, you know, yeah, you know, boss, but... That hot copy and that lit cigarette is a bit of a problem. You know, one thing we didn't do, we posted guards and we put up security cameras, but we forgot to use ground penetrating radar to check for tunnels. And obviously there must be a tunnel with a secret passageway, perhaps behind one of these big bookshelves here, where somebody came in and they were drinking a cup of coffee, smoking a cigarette, they heard us coming and they slipped out. That's, that's an infinitely more reasonable explanation then it's been that way for over a year. He says, yeah, but you have to remember, we're the experts. All we have to do is have the same story, go to the media and say, we are the experts. We will certify that this room has been secure without trespassing for over a year. And they always listen to what the experts say. If there's somebody who they deem not to be an expert who disagrees, they shun them, they won't listen to them, won't give them any press time. 
Well, we have to do is say, we all agree, and we're the experts. And if anybody brings this up, we'll say, yeah, but we're the experts, and we agree that although it's unusual, under certain circumstances, a coffee cup can remain steaming hot uh, for over a year, and a cigarette can burn for over a year. And since we're the experts, how dare you defy what we say? Well, expert opinion doesn't trump facts, logic, truth. When somebody asks you to ignore obvious truth, they've got an agenda behind that. You look for what's the agenda. Follow the money, they often say. Follow the agenda. When it comes to this evidence that shows the fossil record is young, which destroys Darwin's theory, they have a big agenda to get rid of God. And the only show in town that allows that is evolution. And so they all agree, only the experts should be listened to, these scientists who have PhD and have won awards, but they're creationists. They're not real scientists. You can't listen to them, they're not real. They look real, but they're not. <laughs> but we, all real scientists, agree that this can last this long. How? Well, we have theories, and, and someday we'll all agree on that theory, but in the meantime, we already know what the truth is, so we're not going to let this evidence throw us off the track. Yeah. That's not unbiased science. That's believing what you want to believe in spite of the facts. Need to point that out. So, I close with a quote from a first century Roman poet. He said, a drop of amber from the weeping plant fell unexpected and embalmed an ant. The little insect we so much condemn is from a worthless ant become a gem. And you know that's true. If you have a, even an ant in a piece of amber, it's worth a whole lot more than if it has no flora or fauna fossil in it. But amber is especially valuable to us because it acts as that amazing chronometer. Like that cup of coffee, like that lit cigarette, it's glaringly telling us what they're saying cannot be true. They may be agreeing that it can last that long, but they have no reasonable evidence to support it other than their agreement. And that shouldn't cut it in matters of science and logic. In conclusion, we'll take one last look at that marvelous amber room. You know, there's some interesting things here. God causes the wrath of men to praise him, the scripture says. And he likes to turn uh, our you know, ashes into gold. He likes to, from judgment, bring forth redemption somehow. And if it weren't for the judgment of the flood, this wood resin never would have turned into the beautiful amber gems that we can enjoy today. And the evidence that his word is true about the history of this planet, the reality of the flood, the true age of the fossil record, it wouldn't be there if the flood hadn't preserved these in just the way it did. So when we look at the amber room, we see a confirmation of God's truth. And it reminds us of the grandeur that we'll all someday partake of because God's word is true in Genesis. We can believe it there. Amber proves it's the true history, not the history of man, but the history of God is true. And because his word is true in Genesis, we can certainly believe his word in Revelation where we get this marvelous promise that the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, the city of God shall descend from heaven to the new earth where there's no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain, no more tears, no more curse, no more death. It says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them and be their God, and we shall be his people. And we will live in the city of God, far more glorious than the amber. Twelve different gemstones in its foundation. A wall of purest jasper, which looks like blood. It's blood red, indicating if you want to come into that eternal abode, you must come through the blood. The gates themselves are made out of huge carved pearls, white being the color of righteousness. If you come God's way through the blood, you get the whiteness of righteousness forever. And we'll dwell in a city so beautiful, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered the heart of man, what God has prepared. But the amber room will just be a dim reflection of the glory there. Even the buildings and the streets are made of such pure gold that it's transparent. It'll have a golden hue that you can see through it. It's just an awesome promise. And we can believe God's promise in Revelation because Amber has proven that his word is true in Genesis. From Genesis through Revelation, he is the one to believe, not the words of man. So I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I've turned this thing off by accident. <laughs> I guess it's still up there. So that's good. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll go ahead and close in prayer, and I'll be out there if you want to look at the amber fossils and diatoms, and if you have any questions, and of course, I have the DVDs there. 
also, so let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that in these last days, when there's so much doubt, there's so much lies and deception, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one who is the father of lies. And the whole world system and philosophy is designed to reject you, say you don't exist, say we don't need you, and to lie in the name of science. Father, we thank you that you have hidden this jewel of truth, even more powerful than the dinosaur soft tissue, in showing with these little chronometers that your word is true. That flood made those fossils, and it made it just thousands of years ago, or they would not even exist. I pray, Father, you'll help us to seal these truths in our hearts, that we would better appreciate the truth of your word, that we would better know you and honor you and love you, and that we would be better able to share with people who are so hardened and darkened by the lies of this world, that the Bible is true. It gives the true history of this planet. It gives the true history of man's creation, of his fall, of his need for redemption, and of the Redeemer Christ who came and gave it all so that we could have our place in the eternal city of God, much better than that amber room. Father, we thank you for all this, and we pray you'll help us to remember it and use it for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you.